good morning friends and a warm welcome to today's program on chetras visited by sri purandara dasar v c ram is presenting it for us today last year he handled the life history of dikshitar he took us from thiruvarur to benares from back up to etaipuram let's see where all he takes us today welcome thank you thank you dc for that introduction thanks very much for inviting me dc is a man who is very difficult to say no to so in the mari oru nee vandu vani mahal la vandu pesin sonna odane oh i better remove this is a very sabavada indication that the point is that avaru in the mari vandu pesin sonna odane you know i couldn't say no and then because we had just sharda and i had just come back from leading a heritage tour to hampi and my mind was full of purandara dasa at that time so i said that i will do the kshetras of uh, purandara dasa and this is a topic that i have been uh, researching on and off and i have been salting away information at the back of my mind and gradually when i started work on the presentation proper i found that he had traveled a lot and uh, while we talk about muthuswami dikshitar as having traveled uh, purandara dasa has also traveled and uh, if you consider that dikshitar lived between uh, 1775 and 1835 purandara dasa lived between 1484 and 1564 so he was almost two centuries earlier and he also appears to have traveled quite a bit and somewhere there is uh, he appears to be the one of the earliest composers to describe temples and uh, leave a kshetra nama in the kriti and tell us that uh, this is where he went this is what he visited this is what he saw and uh, when you go through the songs you also realize that in some temples the condition hasn't changed from the time that uh, when he went to when we are worshiping so uh, it it establishes a remarkable continuity in hindu sanatana dharma it also establishes a great continuity in terms of our music that a composer like purandara dasa who is the grand sire of carnatic music so to speak was seeing something that we are also seeing and so it it also makes us wonder about our country that while on one hand heritage gets destroyed rapidly on the other hand heritage does survive and uh, it continues and we are able to uh, see what purandara dasa saw so that is really the brief and uh, i can't say that this is an extensively researched presentation at the end of it i'm sure you will come up with several kshetras and songs that i would not have covered and i will only add it to my volume of uh, knowledge and then i will acknowledge you duly when i present it again somewhere when i get the opportunity so uh, about before i take you to purandara das sir where is the screen by the way oh somewhere ha ah, so okay as long as you can see it i am quite happy the uh, purandara himself purandara dasa the place of his birth is a subject of great dispute and uh, even today i mean as recently as 3 months ago there were newspaper articles contesting earlier claims about his place of birth and establishing other locations as his place of birth so but that is so true of uh, so many uh, composers narayana tirtha's place of demise itself is a subject of dispute dispute how can you uh, dispute a samadhi but there are people who say that he died he did not die where he is presently buried but there is another samadhi and that is so varahur and tirupundurthi are forever locked in uh, hostile combat over this and each celebrates the event in a different uh, date and a different time so uh, th- uh, even tyagaraja's place of birth is disputed by some some people say that it is not in tiruvarur but he was born in tiruvayyar itself but and so we leave it to those people to split hairs but what we do know is that purandara dasa was a very much an entity of this great empire called the vijayanagar empire the vijayanagar empire itself comes into existence uh, thanks to the invasion of the tughlaqs which took place in the uh, 13th century and uh, they left behind great chaos and when they went back they found that they could not administer their territory by themselves which is when two brothers harihara and bukka come in the 1330s and they they decide to establish an empire there are again conflicting accounts of 
how they got the authority to establish the empire. Some people say the Tughlaq dynasty, the Tughlaq ruler himself gave them the authorization and they came back and they established the uh, empire in Vijayanagar. As to how they selected the place, there is a legend that they were out hunting and they were chasing a hare when they found that the hare turned around and attacked the hounds at a particular spot. And they decided that that would be the place of the empire. And they uh, consulted their Kula Guru, who was Madhava Vidyaranya, who was the preceptor of the Shringeri Mat, Shringeri Sharada Peetham. And he said that this is the right place to establish the empire. And uh, because he was Vidyaranya, it also becomes Vidyanagara Rajadhani. It is known as Vidyanagara. And uh, as you know, in Telugu, uh, Vidya is also pronounced as Vidya. And therefore, Chagaraja is what many people pronounce Tyagaraja. So gradually over a period, it also becomes Vijayanagara, the kingdom of the city of victory. So even today, when you read the Pravaram of the Sringeri Acharyas, it will always, they will say, Karnataka Simhasana Adhishwara Vidyanagara Rajadhani Tungabhadra Tiravasi. This is how they will start reading the Pravaram for the Sringeri Acharyas. Even today, they establish the connect with uh, Vijayanagara. So Vijayanagar is established as the capital. It is not the, 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 the town is Vijayanagar, which is the capital, and it is on the banks of the river Tungabhadra. Uh, in that area, the river is also known as Pampa. And because in Karna Kannada, the word pa and ha are interchangeably used, it becomes humpy over a period of time. And that marks the northern boundary of the Vijayanagar Empire established in the 1330s and by the 1370s itself it has conquered much of what we recognize today as peninsular india so madurai trichy all these places come under the sway of the vijayanagar empire and they the vijayanagar rulers then set about repairing the damage caused by the invaders earlier so sri rangam is reconstructed several temples are endowed with land and money to construct Gopuras and extended Prakaras. And so between 1330 and 1565, when Sh Sh Vijayanagar is completely desecrated and sacked in the Battle of Talikota, uh, almost 230 years, you find that there is an extraordinary amount of temple building, temple resurrection, the uh, rewriting of legends, the uh, re revitalizing of the lives of saints, so there is a great resurgence of the bhakti movement. And uh, between 1400 and 1520, uh, or actually even uh, a little earlier than 1520, say between 1400 and by the early 1500s, there is one solid kingdom that forms the northern boundary of Vijayanagar, which is the Bahmani Sultanate. And so they are forever locked in combat with each other between the uh, between uh, Vijayanagar and the Bahmani kingdom. And each time the Vijayanagar kingdom, it cannot be denied, actually comes off a little badly off in all its combats with the Bahmani Sultanate. And then in the early 1500s, the Bahmani Sultanate splinters and becomes five independent kingdoms, Bidar, Berar, Ahmednagar, Bijapur, and Golconda. And once that happens, Vijayanagar really becomes the most powerful empire in South India. They stop paying tributes to the Bahmani Sultanate. In fact, for some time, there is a Bahmani Sultan in Gulbarga. He is crowned at the behest of the Vijayanagar ruler. So, uh, in fact, uh, Krishna Devaraya, who is the greatest king of the Vijayanagar Empire and who ruled between 1509 and 1529, he uh, gives himself the title of crowning the sultans in the north. That is how he recognizes himself. So it is only with his blessings that the, uh, the Bahmani Sultan is crowned in Gulbarga. But the powers have gone from that man's hands and it is these five kingdoms. And as long as they are splintered, everything is fine with Vijayanagar. It has an extraordinary amount of wealth, no tribute to be paid to anybody. And all that money is pumped in into the building of temples all along peninsular India. So today, when you go to Kalahasti, till recently, we celebrated Krishna Devaraya's uh, 500th year of accession by allowing the Gopuram that he built in Kalahasti to collapse. So that was our tribute to that great ruler. For several years, a vertical crack was developing in that uh, the Gopuram, and everybody who saw it, including the 
wonderful archaeological survey of India, a very learned body and uh, doing a lot of good work in its own speed, which is the only thing that I have to complain about. They said, yes, yes, we must do something about it. Yes, it's widening. Yeah, it isn't it? It's becoming a little wider since we last saw. Yes, something must be done. A file must be created on it. And one day the temple Gopuram took its own fate into its hands and collapsed. And that ended the uh, story of the Vijayanagar Gopuram in Kalahasti. But if you go down to Kanchi, you go down to Kumbakonam, you go down to Sri Rangam, you will find several, you go up to Sri Viliputu, uh, which is deep down south, you will find there are several Gopurams attributed to the Vijayanagar rulers, Arahar Kovil. You will also find Raya Gopurams, which are invariably Mota Gopurams. There, are, there is nothing built further, which means the endowment was created to build a Gopuram. The first layer, layer level was built. Thereafter came either the king died or the battle of Talikota happened and the rest of the Gopuram was never constructed. In Sri Viliputur, you will find a later, thanks to Thirumalai Nayak, much later, a Gopuram was built and the Gopuram has no connection with the temple because a compound wall was to be built to integrate the Gopuram with the rest of the Andal Rangamanar shrine and Vatapatra Shai shrine, but it never happened. And so the Gopuram stands by itself a little distance outside the temple and that is the symbol, as we all know, of the government of Tamil Nadu. So uh, these are all examples of what the kings were doing at that time. And... Uh, at its height, when Krishna Deva was the ruler between 1509 and 1529, it not only included South India, it also included a significant part of Orissa. So that was the extent of the empire. You can see that there is a narrow neck which then connects it with Orissa. So with Orissa coming in, a large quantity of tribute by way of rice, by way of several other products began to come into uh, Vijayanagar. The Coromandel Coast, which is where we are, was supplying cloth in huge quantities and that was also being exported. Horses were being imported from Saudi Arabia. So it was a very, very bustling and dynamic empire. And it gave, during the time that this empire existed, we also had this huge bhakti movement. The Dasa Kuta, the Dasas who sang the glories of the Lord and went from place to place just spreading the word of bhakti. So it's very interesting that on one side, there was so much material prosperity. At the same time, there was a lot of spiritual prosperity as well. So one side, you had merchants and kings and rulers getting tribute and establishing temples and all that. The other side, you also had a huge quantity of dasas, numbers of dasas going around singing from place to place. None other than Vyasaraya, the, was the vice chancellor was the chancellor of the university that was created in Hampi by Krishna Deva, and his disciples were Kanaka Dasa and Purandara Dasa. They all came and took initiation into the Dasa Kuta from Vyasaraya himself. So this was the glory of Vijayanagar, and this was the glory of the Dasa Kutas. And uh, this is the plan of the capital of Hampi, which today is just a collection of the most wonderful ruins possible. But when you go there, you can you just need to take a book of Purandara Dasa with you and you walk around and he comes alive at every corner. You, you suddenly find a reference in one song which you think could probably be this place. It could probably be that place. He's suddenly talking about uh, people giving charity. Suddenly he's talking about a courtesan. So you realize you're standing in front of the Sule Bazaar, which is the courtesan's quarter in uh, Vijayanagar. Then he's talking about making ornaments. So you realize this is a jeweler's bazaar over there. He's singing about Krishna. There is a wonderful Krishna temple, Rama. There's a Rama temple, Achyuta. There is a Achyuta temple. So, and so on and so forth. For every song of Purandara Dasa, you sometimes think that everything was in Hampi, but that is not so. We'll carry on with the rest of the story. Krishna Deva was crowned king in 1509 and he ruled up to 1529 for 20 years only. And he was perhaps not older than 50 when he died. But he left behind such a long impress on our minds that even today we are living off the bounty of Krishna Deva in several ways because of some of the temples that he established, some of the scholars whom he uh, encouraged. The entire concept of poetry in Telugu comes to its fruition under Krishna Deva. And Krishna Deva writes one of the greatest kavyas of Andhra poetry, which is called the Amukta Malyada, which is the story of Goda, Andal, in Tamil. He writes it in Telugu. 
and uh, he also leaves behind a beautiful description of life in vijayanagar in the entire kingdom when you read that po that poetry with that poem you get an idea as to how people lived how kings lived how the devotees lived and so on then there was tenali ramakrishna who was his court poet and who was one of the ashtadiggajas the oldest being alasani pedanna who wrote manucharitam and the youngest being tenali ramakrishna who wrote Pandu, uh, panduranga mahatmyamu so along with uh, manucharitam panduranga mahatmyamu uh, then the amukta malyada and then there are two others parijata apaharana of pingali suranna and one more these five form the first five mahakavyas in telugu and from then prabandha kavyas in uh, telugu and from then on the tradition of composing prabandhas takes uh, goes forward so you had great compositional strengths as well in uh, vijayanagar at that time while purandara dasa was living there now purandara dasa was born in 1484 and we do have this long persisting legend i call it a legend because we have no idea as to when purandara was really born there is there is not any there is no record really which says that he was born in 1484 we do not know where he was born because that is a subject of dispute but we do have this legend that says that purandara was a was srinivas and ayak who was a jeweler or was a money lender by profession and a skin flint who would not give money for anything even for the treatment of his father the legend goes that the father was very ill and he said it's all right for an old man he has to die in any case so what's the point in something that apollo hospitals may not agree with today <laughs> but uh, that was uh, you know <laughs> purandara dasa's uh, srinivas and ayak's way of living and then comes this brahmin to uh, say that you know his son's uh, sacred threat ceremony is going to be performed purandara chases him away and then the brahmin goes to saraswati who is the wife of purandara dasa and says that i have got to perform the sacred threat ceremony of my son and saraswati takes off her diamond nose ring and gives it to him and says go and sell it and use it and he comes to purandara to sell it and shrinivasa nayak and he immediately recognizes it so he uh keeps it here and then he goes home and then he asks the wife as to where is the diamond nose ring and then through the grace of god it arrives in her in the puja room where she has gone to pray and to take her life because her husband has suspected her and she doesn't know what to answer and when he when she gives the diamond ring he goes back to the shop and finds the identical one and then he asks his wife and she tells him that this is what happened they search for the brahmin who is nowhere to be found Srinivasa Nayak realizes that there is a higher life and he immediately gives up everything he becomes a dasa and together with his wife and his three sons he becomes a member of the dasa kuta how do we uh, interpret that this is what he did in one song he says blessed is my wife because of whom i took to this staff so and he says may her tribe increase may her family be wealthy and you know may her family be happy because because of her i have taken to this there is a wonderful book by uh, uh, william jackson which is the songs of three great south indian saints which is anamacharya purandara dasa and kanaka dasa uh, published by uh, who is this oxford and available at motilal banarsi das so if you want to read more you should look at this book so it says whatever has happened has all been for the best it has become a rich opportunity for serving further shridhara adadella oliye aitu everything that has happened has happened to the good once i was ashamed of holding the staff may my wife's family increase a thousand fold because of her i have come to hold the sadhu staff so we do know that the wife played a very significant role in this conversion and that gives credence to this story as well a credibility to this story and he is initiated into the dasa kuta by vyasaraya that is well documented and vyasaraya says among dasas you have to be purandara dasa so he also recognizes the greatness of his uh, disciple he also recognizes the purandara dasa recognizes the greatness of kanaka dasa who is the other disciple of uh, vyasaraya also so the dasa kuta define godhead in three forms anna brahma kanchana brahma and nada brahma so nada brahma the deity who is to be worshiped with music is purandara vithala of pandharpur 
the kanchana brahma who is the brahma made of gold no prices for guessing shrinivasa and tirumala and anna brahma is udupi krishna where feeding happens on a continuous basis all the time so this these are the three great deities of the dasakuta and they are you, you will find that they are invariably covered in the compositions of the saints of the dasakuta and of course purandara dasa takes his ankita as purandara vithala and therefore we assume the story is that he was born in purandargarh or pandharpur and from then on he traveled we have no idea whether he was born there but what cannot be denied is that vithala was not in pandharpur during the time of krishna deva vithala had been brought away to vijayanagar and he had been kept here and a great temple for vithala was being built and built and built without end by the kings of vijayanagar every king embellished that temple of course during krishna deva's time a mahant comes from pandharpur and requests the ruler to return vithala to him and so vithala is returned and vithala is taken back to pandharpur and a replacement idol obviously would have been placed in uh, this particular temple that was not completed even in 1565 when vijayanagar was destroyed so this temple <laughs> nobody knows when it started and it just they kept building it and building it and building it and even today it is there as a magnificent ruin when you go there you can see that whoever all of them must have lavished their wealth on this particular temple they must have employed the best artisans the best craftsmen the best jewelers to decorate the, and the area of the temple is so immense that even today you are taken in a buggy all the way to the temple battery drawn uh, vehicle you can those of us who are physically able can walk but and even as you are walking or you are driving along in that buggy you will find there are mantapas that are half finished half destroyed enormous horse statues put up in front of all the mantapas behind the temple there is a further area which is leading down up to the river it is if it had survived in its entirety it would have been a magnificent temple as a ruin it is no less that is what i would like to say so vitala himself was in hampi for some time so whether purandara sang of him in vijayanagar or whether he sang of him in pandharpur we do know that he sang of him in an, in plenty of his songs the if vitala temple was being constructed without end during the time of uh, the vijayanagar rulers there was one temple that existed even before vijayanagar and that even today remains in worship there and that is the pampapati temple or the virupaksha temple this temple had existed even before vijayanagar came to this particular area and it continued in existence and it was the only temple that was not destroyed by the invaders in 1565 so the worship as to why we have no idea even today there are number of theories established as to why the virupaksha temple escaped the wrath of the invaders but it did and it you, you can still see that much of it is intact and this gopuram that you see over here was built by krishna deva to mark his accession to the throne in 1509 there is a huge stone slab inside which gives the full details of this particular the construction of this temple of this particular gopura the swami here is known as pampapati because it is believed that he married tungabhadra the river pampa as his as his consort and the goddess here is the river and uh, the water of the river actually flows up to the kitchen and then goes out and the food today for the temple is even today cooked from the water of the tungabhadra only and uh, this is a fairly large temple when you go there you realize that the simplest of songs that all of us began learning was composed over here and i'm going to play a video because what happened was 45 of us went to this temple along with ashwath narayan and the singer and when we went there we then climbed up the hemakuta hill which is just next to the virupaksha temple it was dusk and uh, he i said you must sing here so he said sir this song everybody will know so if you don't mind with your permission i will request everybody to sing so all 45 of us in different shrutis pitches talas just like we all do when we were young we all shrieked and howled kunda gaura gauri vara mandiraya mana makuta mandara kusumakara makarandam vasituva hemakuta simhasana virupaksha manavasrita so this is the hemakuta hill with virupaksha temple just next to it 
and soon that crowd of 45 had become 100 or so because every tourist there knew the song so they all assumed that it was some choral singing that was happening so they all came and began singing along with us i'll just after that build up i hope this video works so now <laughs> Shruti's. The Adhara Shadjam is lost completely. <laughs> There's one man video recording us. We don't even know who he is right at the back. <laughs> This is the uh, the Vitala temple which I told you about, which never attained completion and was destroyed in 1565. The chariot that you see in the middle is today the symbol of the government of Karnataka's tourism department. And it is the most photographed uh, structure in the whole of Karnataka. Everybody will stand next to it and take a photograph. So this Vitala probably stood here, we don't know. And this is probably where Purandara composed many of his songs on Vitala. We don't know about that. This is Krishna in Udupi. So this is the Anna Brahma. And as you know, here, thanks to Purandara's friend, we can't see Krishna face to face. You have to see him through a Navadwara, which is called Kanakana Kindi. Because the, when Kanakadasa came, they <laughs> refused to allow him inside the temple because of his background. And so Krishna turned in the direction of, which, of where Kanakadasa faced. And so he got the darshan, and today all of us have to look at Krishna from that window. And uh, let us hear a small uh, a part of a song that Purandara composed on Udupi Krishna before we go further. Kandena Udupiya Krishna Na Kandena The reason why I played this song for you is it gives an entire description of uh, the reason why I played that recording to you is that it describes the whole of Udupi town, this particular song. It says that I saw, I'm, I'm not reading the Kannada, but I'm just reading the, I'm reading a rough translation that I have done of the composition. So it says, I saw Udupi Krishna, I first had a bath in the sea. And then I saw the Chandra Maulishwara temple. Then I saw Anandeshwara. Then I worshipped Hanuman. And then I went to worship Udupi Krishna. Even today, this is the normal tradition. When pilgrims go, they will go and pay their respects to all these temples. And then they will go inside. And then once he goes inside, he is able to see the Surya Prabha. He is able to see the Madhya, Madhva Sarovara. He is able to see Ashta Munihala Kande. Those are the eight muts that are there in uh, Udupi, Ashta Munihala Kande, then Prasiddhavagiruva Sri Udupi Krishna Nakande. After that, I saw the famous Udupi Krishna. He was holding the Mat in one hand, etc., etc. That whole description then follows of this, uh, in this particular song. But if he 
if he went to see, he, as I said, he has already sung on Nada Brahma, then he is singing about uh, uh, the Anna Brahma, then let us see what he has to say about Kanchana Brahma. This is Venkata Chalapati. Krishna Deva, in his lifetime, goes at least seven times to Tirumala and lavishes endowments on the temple. On one occasion in the 1520, 1521, he is extraordinarily happy because he's had a son. And he goes to Tirmala temple in thanksgiving and he uh, does a lot of donations to the temple. Of course, the child dies within a year of his coming back. And then Krishna Deva doesn't have a son till 1528. 1528 when he has a son again and that child also dies. And it is in that grief that Krishna Deva actually passes away in 1529. So uh, the, the temple of Tirumala acquires a lot of fame during the time of Purandara Dasa. As, and uh, as I said, Krishna Deva rules between 1509 and 1529. Purandara Dasa lived between 1484 and 1564. Assume that he was middle-aged by the time he acquired this realization. He, it must have been right in the middle of Krishna Deva's reign that he must have come and he must have met Vyasaraya and he must have become a member of the Dasakuta. So he goes to the Tirmala temple when it is in all its glory. We'll hear Vasanta Kumari sing Venkata Chala Nilayam and I will sing, I will, I'll pull out a few references for you uh, in the meantime. Venkata Chala Nilayam Vaipunta Puravatam Venkata Chala Nilayam Vaipunta Puravatam Venkata Chala Nilayam Vaipunta Puravatam Pankajanetram Parama Pavitram Pankajanetram Parama Pavitram Pankajanetram Parama Pavitram Shankachakradhara Chinmaya Rupam Venkatajala Nilayam Vaikunta Puravasam So, in this particular song that I, I just tried to locate it, but I'm unable to, but the song is basically a step-by-step -step description of how you go into the uh, Venkateshwara temple in Tirmala. It says, first, I had my bath in the uh, Sarovara that is there. Then I saw the uh, Varaha Swami. I mean, having had his darshanam, I went to this Mahadwara, then I entered the Mahadwara, I saw the Dwajasthamba with Garuda there. Then I joined the huge crowds in entering the shrine. And once I went there, I was then he describes the deity from head to foot and describes all the ornaments. So this huge crowd, I don't know whether Jarugandi existed at that time, but it almost appears as though he also was one of us going into this particular temple to witness what was happening over there. And uh, the structure, even today when you go to Tirmala, despite all the crowd that we have over there, you still are expected to have a bath in that Ananda Sarovara and then go and have a darshan of Varaha Murti and only then go in. Even today they will say that if you have not had a darshan of Varaha Murti, your visit to Tirmala is incomplete. Most of us bypass it, of course. We don't go in. To be, we, we just need to go in and come out. That's the most important thing for us. But this is the proper way of doing it, and Purandara establishes that particular tradition. There are any number of songs on Narasimha. Uh, some of the Narasimhas, we have no idea where he composed them, but three of them we do, uh, two of them we know, no, three actually, we know where he did compose some of those, uh, those songs. But the biggest monolith in Vijayanagar is this, is this Narasimha. Originally a Lakshmi Narasimha with the Lakshmi seated on the right, uh, on the left thigh of uh, Narasimha facing him at right angles to him. You can actually see a part of her arm still stuck to the uh, idol. I'll, uh, let me see if I can get it for you. Uh, there is a slender on the uh, left arm of Narsimha, you can see one slender stone column going through. That is actually her hand. So the idol was completely hacked off, as were the hands of the Shankha and the Chakra of this particular Narsimha. And this idol, we know thanks to a stone ins inscription on its side, that it was done in 1528, just one year before Krishna Deva was going to uh, pass away. And so uh, 
this this must have been a huge or inspiring structure even during purandara dasa's time but he has composed on other temples and one of the interesting temples that he appears to have gone to is namakkal where is vijayanagar where is namakkal that you know he has traveled all that distance near salem simha roopanada shri hare he namagiri sane this is a song that he has uh, composed and in the book that i have it says kedara gaula but i could not locate any uh, particular recording of this particular song but he appears to have traveled all the way up to namakkal visited that particular shrine and gone back during uh, of course what is purandara dasa without compositions on krishna and uh, uh, the more, you know the several songs are there jagadot dharana is there which is what i'm going to play for you now but uh, the very worship of krishna was very big in vijayanagar during the time of krishna deva it is interesting to see that uh, the vijayanagar rulers started off as shaivites but by the time of krishna deva they had become staunch vaishnavites and madhvacharya's uh, philosophy is what they followed it is not that they neglected the shiva temples they continued their worship there but the big temples that were going to be constructed were all that of mahavishnu and uh, king krishna deva himself undertook a battle to conquer kalinga or orissa the gajapatis of orissa whom he conquered in uh, 1520 or thereabouts and uh, having conquered the gajapati he brings away the gajapati's son and wife to vijayanagar and keeps them as hostage so that he can negotiate terms with the ruler he becomes very friendly with the son of the gajapati ruler and uh, that boy is an expert fenceman swordsman and krishna deva once says that uh, you should give a demonstration of your uh, skill and uh, the prince agrees and next day in the morning when he arrives at the arena he discovers that he has to fight with a soldier and not with the king himself see krishna deva was a superb athlete himself and this is documented very well all his exercise regime his physical fitness how he would get up at 3 in the morning cover himself with sesame oil and then lift weights and uh, till all the oil had been sweated out of his body then he would go on a horse ride at super speed all around vijayanagar which was 60 miles in circumference mind you and then come back and then box with his special trainers and then go and have a bath and then worship and go on to take the throne every day in the morning so he was a physical fitness so he must have been on this original keto diet or whatever it is in his lifetime and he must have had six pack abs for all you know so the prince expects that the ruler is going to fence with him and when he realizes that it's a common soldier he says that i really feel sorry for my fate that somebody of royal blood like me is going to fight with a common soldier and he stabs himself and kills himself this news goes back to the gajapati who says that i have lost my son i would at least request that my wife is returned to me in safety krishna deva agrees but lays a condition that gajapati's daughter should be given in marriage to him and so the princess is sent the princess is naturally not well inclined to king krishna deva because she uh, he has you know he is responsible for the loss of prestige of the family and uh, the son, the brother has been killed and so the uh, the krishna deva himself is told that when you go to marry her do not go in person send your sword and just by touching the sword she will become your wife but he is unable to resist so he goes as one of the palanquin bearers of this sword and she recognizes him because in all the chaos of the wedding they never removed the special anklet around his foot which signifies that he, which signifies that he is the king so she packs a sword into her marriage garb uh, you know sari and when she meets him in private when he touches her the sword falls down and he realizes that she was going to attempt make an attempt on his life so he banishes her and then she spends the rest of her life full of respect full of wealth in a place called kambam in andhra and she is never allowed to come to meet krishna deva thereafter but krishna deva falls in love with a krishna idol that is in orissa a bala krishna idol and he brings the bala krishna idol to vijayanagar and he builds this big temple which is known as the krishna temple in vijayanagar in the sack of hampi that particular temple is destroyed and the arms of that idol are cut off and it is just thrown away there today it is in the government museum in chennai 
So when you, if at all you want to see it, you should go and see it here. A wonderful Balakrishna seated uh, with one hand resting on his thigh. We don't know what the other hand was doing because it is completely destroyed. So this is a, this Krishna temple is huge. And I'm not saying that Purandara would have composed Jagadot Dharana here, but I'm just saying that this probably could have been one of the locations. So let's listen to Jagadot Dharana before we go further. This is another view. This is the Hazara Rama temple, but uh, I don't know what I did with Jagadot Dharana. Let me see if it comes later. But this is the Hazara Rama temple, which is a Rama temple that Krishna Deva creates. And there are lots of songs of Purandara Dasa on Rama. And there is one song, which is a Dodaya Mangalam, which is Jaya Jaya, Jaya Janaki Kanta, which is almost the way the king would have been hailed when he stepped onto the throne every day in the morning. So because this was a royal temple, I have chosen to put Jaya Jaya here in this particular slide. Jaya 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 Janaki Kanta Jaya Sadhu Jala Vinuta Jaya Dubai Mananta Jaya Bhajavanta Jaya 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 Janaki Kanta Jaya Sadhu Jala Vinuta Jaya Dubai Mananta Jaya Bhajavanta Jaya 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 Janaki Now, in Hampi itself, there is a Yantrodharaka Anjaneya Swami temple. This is one of several Anjaneya Swami temples. I think there are around 300 of them, if I'm not mistaken, consecrated by Vyasaraya himself. And uh, these exist all over South India. So you go to uh, even, uh, I think we were there in, uh, where was this? In Bikshandar Kovil or some such thing recently, where also they have an Anjaneya consecrated by uh, Vyasaraya there. And uh, they show the symbol of why they consider it to be a Vyasaraya's Anjaneya, because it's got its tail lifted up and there is a bell hanging at the top. Uh, that is not here. And uh, he's holding a flower in one hand. So that, they say, is typical of the Anjaneyas that Vyasaraya consecrated. Now, this particular temple is a very tiny shrine on the banks of the Tungabhadra, and you have to walk on a very rocky path all along the Tungabhadra River. And suddenly you will find that the rocks are so big that they actually form an arch above your head, and you walk through the arch, and then you come out onto the other side. And at one particular place, the Tungabhadra becomes a circle. It circles itself and then goes out in the other direction. So that's called Chakratirtha. And when you go up the Chakratirtha, you climb a small flight of steps and then you come to this tiny temple. This is called the Yantrodharaka Anjaneya Swami temple because it is said that Vyasaraya tried consecrating Anjaneya here, but he kept flying away. Finally, Vyasaraya created the star-shaped yantra and pushed Anjaneya inside and said, stay here, don't get out of this particular place. So he is considered to be a living idol. And because it was such a humble temple, it escaped the desecration when the, when the invaders came in 1565. This and a temple next to it for Sugriva, these have survived completely. And so here, Anjaneya Swami is worshipped. Tiny cave of a temple. And this is where Purandara Dasa composes Swami Mukya Prana. Because it says, Yantrodharaka Nindu. I'll play the video again because that's the only recording I have. And then we'll go on further. Some conversation and all will be there. Mukya Pranani Malevar Guntalagana Sakala Vidya Pravinani Hididha Yora Maracharana Swami Mukya Pranani Malevar Guntalagana Sakala Vidya Sorry, now whatever you want. So, in the Kirtana Lakshanas, you see, you know, Ekakshara Prasa, Dvitiakshara Prasa, 
in this song it's antyakshara prasa so all the last words will be rhyming rudra bhadra samudra and the madila varo then in the charanam you will see uh, bandhu nindu sahanindu and the madila varo so all last words will rhyme just wanted you to get notice that ekadashi rudrani ekadashi rudrani hididayo ramar mudra ekadashi rudra ni hididayo ramar mudra setuve gatti samudrani haridayo balabhadra setuve gatti samudrani haridayo balabhadra swami mukhya pranani malevare gantal gana sakal vidya pravinani hididayo ramar charana vai kunta sthaladi dabandu पंपा क्षेत्र निरंदु वैकुंठ स्थल दिंद बंधु पंपा क्षेत्र निरंदु यंत्रो धारक निंदु मंत्रो धारक निंदु यंत्रो धारक निंदु पुरंधर विठलन सहलिंदु यंत्रो धारक निंदु पुरंधर विठलन सहलिंदु स्वामी मुख्य प्राणनी मलेवरे गंटल गाना सकल विद्या प्रवीणनी हिडिदयो रामर चरणा the reason why i wanted to play the whole thing is the charanam ka the mudra the kshetra mudra comes at the end the other thing is this is one of the few temples in hampi where you know purandara composed there otherwise it's very everything is a ruin today and you can just assume one or the other but this you know for sure so that's the reason why i uh, brought it up i also in all in the midst of all that while you were listening to the song i was very frantically looking for that tirupati song and i found it i am very happy to say so the the part of the line is yesu sorry one second yesu janmada punya bando bando dedi gado shri swami pushkarani yol snana japa tapa maadi varahara devara nodi shri swami mahadwarake ee sarivaranu ee daadi pradakshina maadi having done pradakshina then having aa suvarna garuda gambavena nodi having seen the golden garuda uh, flag staff santosha dim kondadi ide pidate then going inside slowly and then going and having all the darshan of the swami in the middle of a huge crowd that will come somewhere here one second nettane radane dwaravane thandi pogudali dattaniyu bahujanadali so the kootam is not yesterday or uh, day before yesterday it has been there ever since so uh, then we come to this chenna keshava temple in belur today this is known as halabid and uh, this temple was built by a dynasty even before vijayanagara this was built by the hoysalas and it took in its time commissioned by a king called vishnuvardhana about whom it is believed that he had a strong association with ramanuja but that is disputed by historians and they say that the timelines do not match but it took 103 years to build and it was completed in the 13th century and almost immediately thereafter destroyed then rebuilt by the vijayanagar rulers once again destroyed post the vijayanagar uh, you know collapse again rebuilt in the 18th century and has ever since remained and it is one of the great uh, you know tourist spots today uh, there is a song of purandara dasa on this particular temple also belura chenna keshavana it says in that particular song so we know that he has traveled here there is a very intriguing one line reference to badradri rama in a song which has got several other uh, ref- words it says that he you know he refers to rama at badradri and we do know that badrachala rama existed as a shrine but it was a very minor shrine before badrachala ramadasa spent palace money and got it rebuilt so 
what is likely is that even during purandara dasa's time this particular temple must have been famous enough to for him to refer to it and then for ramadasa to have then completed expanded on the temple of course tyagaraja then pays respect to ramadasa in his composition in shira sagara shayana where he says that you know he talks about ramadasa and he mentions him in yet another uh, song as well i think it's in shira sagara shayana where he says that if i was ramadasa uh, uh, you know sita would have interceded on my behalf and spoken to you because ramadasa composes a song nannu cheppa nannu brova mani cheppave sita matalli so this is an indirect reference to that by tyagaraja so we have one temple that connects purandara dasa bhadrachala ramadasa and tyagaraja all three of them one after the other and that is this particular shrine he has composed on ahobilam narsimha there are songs on ahobilam where he talks about all the narsimhas in that particular area he talks about uh, the temple itself he talks about the matha now because he uh, you know krishna deva goes to uh, uh, orissa it appears that purandara dasa followed him there is one song on krishna where he refers to him as nilagiri vasa and this is nilachala in uh, par- in the orissa parlance uh, jagan puri uh, you know swami jagannatha of puri is also known as nilachala natha so did purandara dasa go here i cannot say so with certainty but perhaps he was aware of the fact that there is a temple there and he composed on it but when we know that adi shankara composed a jagannath ashtakam with every every verse ending with jagannath swami nayanapata agami bhavatume it is quite likely that uh, purandara dasa also could have visited because krishna deva had created that narrow neck and had conquered orissa so purandara dasa could have followed could have gone and composed there as well there are songs on there are several songs on ranganatha several 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 songs on ranganatha we don't know which ranganatha is it the uh, ranganatha of shri rangapatna or is it the ranganatha of uh, of shri rangam we have no idea but there are this is the ranganatha of uh, shri rangapatna coming down from shri rangapatna kannara kande achutana which is sung in varali kanchi koti punya kariraja varadana who is kariraja varadana varadaraja of kanchipuram kanchi koti punya kariraja varadana so he is very clearly establishing that he came and saw varadaraja in kanchipuram and the temple of varadaraja swami several temples in kanchipuram bear the impress of the vijayanagar empire much of the gopurams today it's pallava then chola then much of vijayanagar which is really there in kanchipuram today and so we can very seriously believe that purandara dasa came here and composed this particular song <laughs> chi punya koti kariraja varadana dikshitar we always knew would include utpalavaka vimanam sushobita pranavakara divya vimanam this is punya koti vimanam in varadaraja swami temple so kanchi punya koti kariraja varadana avlo alaga and oru chinna and gopura thoda reference kuda and you know he has the vimana thoda reference he has brought it in there are songs there is one song on anjaneya in sholingar it says ghatika chalagiri ghatikachalam is this sholingar only and it also says that with four arms you are facing the narasimha so we do know that in uh, you know after all in uh, in sholingar the uh, narasimha is on the higher hill 
which looks as though it is more difficult to climb, but that is only till you realize what you have to do when you climb the Anjaneya Swami Hill, which is shorter but even tougher. And the uh, Anjaneya is positioned in such a way that he is looking directly at the Narasimha, who is on the Narasimha Hill. And it is a Chaturbhuja Anjaneya with Shankha and Chakra. That is what Purandara Dasa mentions in his composition also. And even today when you go there, you, you, if you are there at the Deeparadhana time, you will see how the Deeparadhana is done to the Narasimha in such a way that Anjaneya Swami has got a direct line of sight to Narasimha and the Deeparadhana that is taking place there. So Purandara Dasa has visited the temple, he has composed on it. Of course, later Muthuswami Dikshitar also comes to the same temple and composes twin songs, Narasimha Agacha Mohanam, Pavanatma Jagacha in Nata, with the same similar construction. And in Narasimha Agacha, he has a, my favorite story, which even though is not relevant to Purandara Dasa, I'm going to bring it in here, which is Suruchira Karigiri Vichara Varada. That Doddacharyar story, Doddacharyar who was such a great devotee of Kansipuram Varadaraja Swami temple that he would never miss the Garuda Vahanam, the Garuda Seve on whenever it happened. But he grows old and then he is unable to come and then he remains in Cholingar because he is unable to travel. And when that happens, the Garuda Seve comes out of the temple and the Asheriri says, lower the umbrellas because my devotee has to see me. So even today, when the Vardaraja Swami comes out in the Garuda Vahanam in Kanchipuram, there will be one moment when they will lower the umbrellas. And the belief is that Doddacharya is seeing him from, uh, from uh, Sholingar, which is Suruchira Karigiri Vichara Varada. The person who is forever thinking about Karigiri, you gave him a boon. This is in Narsimha Agacha. So similar legends like that. This is the Anjaneya for whom there is a Purandara Dasa composition. He then comes to... Kumbheshwara Swami temple in Kumbakonam. We do know that the concept of Mahamakam, which is celebrated today every 12 years, really acquires stature during the time of the Vijayanagar Empire. And King Krishnadeva himself came to attend one Mahamakam in Kumbakonam. Purandara Dasa also comes. And there is a beautiful Ragamalika, Chandra Chuda, Shiva Shankara Parvati, Ramanani Ninage Namo Namo where in the final charanam, which is very beautifully, incidentally, much of the music here is sung by Vasantha Kumari because nobody greater than her in pop popularizing the compositions of Purandara Dasa. So, Shankara Bharanam, Hamsanandi, Todi and Kamas. So, the, it comes in reverse. So, it goes from Kamas to Hamsanandi, Hamsanandi, Todi, Todi, Shankara Bharanam. That is how the last stanza is structured. And that says, Darage, Dakshina, Dakshina Kaveri Tira, Kumbapura Vasamu Nine. That is the line. So Kumbapura is Kumbakonam. And so this particular song, let's listen to it. <laughs> this is the last stanza. <laughs> The other surprise is going to Thiruvannamalai. Thiruvannamalai where there is a lovely, the, much of the uh, Gopurams are all thanks to the Balalas and then later by the Vijayanagar rulers, the current structure that we see in Thiruvannamalai. There is a song, Karuna Nidhiye Isha Aruna Giriya Vasa, which is on uh, this particular shrine. And I, have, I had requested Amrita Murali to sing the uh, Pallavi alone, which is what I am playing for you. The tunes are set by R.K. Shri Ram Kumar for this particular, as is also for that Yantro Dharaka Anjaneya Swami.
करुणा निधि ये ईशा अरुणा गिरिय पासा करुणा निधि ये ईशा अरुणा गिरिय पासा We then come to Sri Rangam, which definitely was uh, visited by uh, Purandra Dasa, as we know, because there are several songs on Sri Rangam composed by him. But this one, Baba Ranga Bujanga Shayana Komalanga Kripa Panga, says, Yelu Prakarada Malige, the seven enclosured palace, which is what Sri Rangam is. And then it says, Elu Prakara Malige, Manayolage, Galia Deva Deva, Sola Sasira, Gopia Rali, the E. Relu, Loka, the Janakava, Chandra Pushkarini, a Tira Vihara. The Chandra Pushkarini is the the tank which is inside the Sri Rangam temple. Ubaya Kave Ria Madhya Nivasa. So, no doubts. He, we know which Sri Ranga that he went to and he composes this particular song. This is a poor recording, but it is our teacher, Mr. Shetty's mother singing. <laughs> D. Patamal, who was a great composer in her own right, the term Vagyakara is a male reference, so I would say Vagyakarini. Perhaps that's the right word, maybe Vagyakari is right, I have no idea. But she was a great composer who composed in all the 72 Melakattas and left behind a huge corpus of songs. And I was, I had the, I was searching for a good reference and somehow this uh, recording came up and then I said, what better tribute to this wonderful lady because D. Chandrasekhar is the one who got me to come here today and speak on this subject. So I included it here. Shringeri, I told you, I began with Madhava Vidyaranya. So Shringeri was definitely a place. So Pali Samba Muddu Sarade, is composed by Purandara Dasa on this particular shrine. Mm. Balamurli Krishna. Muddushare de Palisam Muddushare de Yenna Nali Gayeli Tapubare de I'm coming to the end of my presentation. In the middle of all, I mean, in the, as I said, this Achu, Vitala temple, which is so huge, at the end of the Vitala temple complex, the, there is a forest like, uh, you know, open area. And then you have this huge stone mandapam, which is on the Tungabhadra, actually in the Tungabhadra. When the floods come, the half the mandapam is completely submerged in it and you can't even go in. But when you go in dry weather, you can walk inside multiple stone pillars, very low ceiling. You can, a person of my height can stand, but not anybody taller than me. You have to stoop when you go inside. And then inside this, in a pillar, you have this carving of Purandara Dasa. So it is believed that this is Purandara Mantapa. This is where Purandara Dasa and the Dasas, and when I say believed, I must say that with a certain degree of certainty, because UNESCO has itself put a stone plaque here which says Purandara Mantapa. So I, I would be willing to, I am willing to believe it and say that this must be backed by some amount of historic research. I do not know when this particular bar relief of Purandara Dasa was carved there, what is the date of this one. 
but it is there and it is so quiet the water is flowing by continuously and there is a venturi effect in that mantapam so there's cool breeze blowing all the time so when you go there and you find yourself alone with purandara dasa your first first impulse is to just fall flat at his feet because there is so much of peace in that mantapam and there is so much of music that he has given us and uh, here it is believed that all the dasas met and they would sing all the time so it is very ironic that at a time when the empire was at its you know material you know zenith there was a group of dasas who were continuously singing that all this will go away one day nothing will be left and you know vishnu's feet are the only things that you have to vaikuntake tamburi meetitava bhavabdi daatitava thala you know the whole thing vaikuntake oditava sometimes when you listen to that song you also want to run along with purandara dasa that the, the way he creates that imagery you know it brings tears to the eyes and then the way he sings about what is required for music thala beku thakka mela beku gala suddhi ira beku you should have clear voice to sing this is what you know simplest of things and some of his wonderful uh, ninda stutis that he composed where you know he starts by saying you know i don't have anybody i am an orphan then finally says ninnante swami yanakundu ninagilla i have got a swami that is you but you don't have anybody and then i have got a home which is your world but you don't have that then i have got a mother who is your queen lakumi then what is nene paradesi nene swadeshi you are the paradesi i am the swadeshi i have got everything in this world you have nothing so who is your mother who is your father this is what he asks and one of the beautiful songs is this ragi tandiro so somehow when i go here i always think ragi tandiro must have been comp- I, i mean i can't tell you that it was composed here i wish i could say that with certainty but ragi tandiro we must listen to it ragi tandiro bichage ragi tandiro bichage ragi tandiro bichage ragi tandiro yogya ragi yogya ragi bhagya vande ragi nevo yogya ragi yogya ragi bhagya vande ragi nevo ragi tandiro bichage ragi tandiro ಅನ್ನದಾನವಾಡುವರಾಗಿ ಅನ್ನ ಛತ್ರ ಬಲಿಟ್ಟವರಾಗಿ ಅನ್ನದಾನವ ಮಾಡುವರಾಗಿ ಅನ್ನ ಛತ್ರ ಬಲಿಟ್ಟವರಾಗಿ ಅನ್ಯವಾದಗಳ ಬಿಟ್ಟವರಾಗಿ ಅನುದಿನ ಬಲನಯ ಮಾಡುವರಾಗಿ ರಾಗಿ ತಂದಿ ಬಿಚ್ಚಗೆ ರಾಗಿ ತಂದಿರು ಬಿಚ್ಚಗೆ ರಾಗಿ ತಂದಿರು ಬಿಚ್ಚಗೆ ರಾಗಿ ತಂದಿರು ಮಾತಾ ಪಿತರನು ಸೇವಿ ಪರಾಗಿ ಪಾತಕ ಕಾರ್ಯವ ಬಿಟ್ಟವರಾಗಿ ಮಾತಾ ಪಿತರನು ಸೇವಿ ಪರಾಗಿ ಪಾತಕ ಕಾರ್ಯವ ಬಿಟ್ಟವರಾಗಿ ಜಾತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ನೀಡದವರಾಗಿ so the word ragi is ragi tandiro have you given ragi to the bhikshaka that starts but then every other line is having done this so agi so that is you know uh, anna uh, the whole thing is uh, yogya ragi bhogya ragi bhagyavanta ragi nivu having become a yogya having celebrated everything in life having attained the height of prosperity have you given ragi to the bhikshaka that is how it comes then annadanava maduva ragi anna chatra dittava ragi having given annadanam then having created an endowment to give rise in perpetuity to people then anya vartagale vittava ragi having destroyed all other thoughts and speeches and useless words have you come and given ragi to the bhikshaka this is how the whole song is structured it somehow for me it encompasses this entire philosophy of purandara dasa and the way he lived before i end i would just like to come to this one particular uh, unusual one that i found only day before yesterday i didn't know about it in s s rajam's uh, musical letter pads there is one song of purandara dasa called shiva darshanam 
where it says that I had a bath in the Ganga and I worshipped Shiva, this Jyotir Linga on Shivaratri day. So I then went looking about for it and found that it says Pathala Ganga. And the only Jyotir Linga that has got Krishna water as Pathala Ganga is the Dhakini Bhima Shankaram, which is, and that probably was visited by Purandara Dasa and he has composed this song there. Again, Vasanta Kumari singing it before I conclude. Shiva Dharu Shanda Namagati Kedi Shivaratriya Jagarane Having remained awake on Shivaratri, Shiva I saw Shiva Dharu Shanda Namagati Kedi Shivaratriya Jagarane Kedi Shiva Dharu Shanda Namagati Kedi before I conclude, Purandara Dasa died in 1564. We do not know where he died. There, that again, there is an element of dispute. See, as I said, Krishna Deva died in 1529 and then his brother Achutaraya became the ruler. The succession in Vijayanagar was never smooth and Krishna Deva also was no saint. He had his elder brother, you know, the, those who had preceded him were no saints either. His elder brother had decreed that Krishna Deva should be blinded so that his son should become the king. The minister had refused to do it and produced a pair of goat eyes and showed the dying king that, you know, your brother has been blinded. So once the king died, Krishna Deva becomes the ruler. In 1528, when he realizes that his son has been killed by poison, he loses his mind to an extent where his trusted minister, Saluva Timbanna, who was the minister who actually brought him to the throne, he suspects that minister of having blinded his, uh, of having killed his son and he blinds the minister and puts the minister and his son in prison. And then Krishna Deva dies the next year. We don't even know how he died, whether he died. There is even a theory that he just left the kingdom and went away in sheer, uh, you know, frustration. We don't know all that. But historically, it is assumed that he died in 1529. His brother, who is in prison, is then resurrected and brought and is made the king, Achyutaraya. But the real power behind the throne is Aliya Ramaraya, who is the son-in-law of Krishna Deva. And Achyuta tries to combat Aliya Ramaraya's powers, but is never successful in doing so. Achyuta remains the ruler till the 1540s. The kingdom continues at its zenith. There is no Outwardly, there is no problem. Because uh, everything is being administered by the powerful Ali Ramaraya and uh, things are going fine. But Achyuta himself is no great king. He is known to be a very vituperative, spiteful, weak ruler. He was nothing that Krishna Deva was. And several scholars left the court. Even Tenali Rama went back to Tenali. He did not live here. You know, Alasani Bedana composes this beautiful poem which says that Krishna Deva took me wherever he went. Today he's gone to a world that I cannot go to. And I am now walking in this earth as a living dead. That is what uh, he says. So they all lamented the departure of Krishna Deva. And then Achyuta rules as king. When Achyuta dies, a puppet ruler, Sadashiva, who is a nephew of Krishna Deva and Achyuta is placed on the throne. And he is kept virtually in prison and produced only once a year during the Navaratri celebrations to the public. Aliya Ramaraya continues to remain the de facto ruler along with his two brothers, Venkatadri and Thirmala. And they become powerful to such an extent that they begin to interfere in those five kingdoms up north that we haven't forgotten about. And whenever they fight amongst each other, these people are invited one against the other. When they go, they destroy mosques. They become more and more arrogant over a period of time. And then in 1564, Purandara dies. 1565, the five rulers decide that combined together we can teach Vijayanagar a lesson. And they combine together and become a confederate. And then they all meet at a place called Rakhasi Tangidi, which is Talikota. And the Vijayanagar forces depart. They have seen several battles. They are not going to be defeated. I mean, uh, we have taught all these rulers so many lessons in the past. Our own ruler has gone and got the title of Paribhuta Suratrana. That is, he has gone and given the title of Sultan to those kings. So how can we be defeated? It's like an entire town migrating. There are carpenters, there are weavers, there are dwellers, there are merchants feeding the army, courtesans. Everybody is going to that battle. And then the battle commences. Ali Ramaraya is already 80 years old at that time. Cannons have already come. Gunfire is very common. 
and he is uh, on an elephant and at one crucial moment in the battle when everything is going their way he changes into a palanquin borne by four palanquin bearers and carries with him bags of copper coins these are meant to be stuffed into the cannons so that when the gunfire is gunpowder is pushed in and it is fired the copper coins will shoot out like bullets and kill everybody so that is what he is doing unfortunately one of the confederate elephants loses its way and it comes in front of ali ramaraya's palanquin the palanquin bearers drop the palanquin and run and they capture ali ramaraya he is taken before the five kings and he is beheaded on the spot the moment he is beheaded it is over the army begins to flee and it is coming back to vijayanagar where everything is going on as though it's a normal day the temple of achuta of vitala is still being constructed there are markets there is bazaars everything is going on as usual and suddenly they realize that things are not as usual the ruler the real ruler is dead his brother comes fleeing back puts together a caravan of 500 elephants and takes the entire treasury with him and takes the puppet ruler sadashiva also with him out of hampi that has never happened before several times the bahmani sultans have invaded come up to the border of vijayanagar the king has never left the king has negotiated peace by parting with his treasury by giving money sending off the rulers he used to buy them off but this time the king chooses to flee once that happens the people of hampi realize that there is no escape so they they get the youth of the town armed and they try to put up a resistance but for 3 days before you know that army of confederates is so huge that it is going to take a week before it comes and during that time there is no escape because the gypsies the lombardies in that area they realize that the town is without guard and they come and they begin plundering the city and then a week later the enemy arrives and with fire and brimstone with crowbar and axe they destroy the city systematically killing the entire population the people have nowhere to go they just have to wait and die and every temple is destroyed every ounce of gold is packed up and taken away and that is it vijayanagar can never come back to what it was all that purandara said ultimately comes to pass it's only the name of vitala that really survives <laughs> and you know all this material wealth everything will go away one day and that is exactly what happened and with that the last great you know kingdom of the deccan of the peninsula really vanishes but it is not as though the sultans were able to enjoy everything they continued fighting amongst each other after that and from up north came akbar and slowly aurangzeb thereafter and conquered everything so with that it all ended but the reason why i'm trying to i just like to end with a personal story my grandmother who's now 95 has a favorite vijayanagar anecdote so she had a grand uncle who was posted as a deputy tahsildar of hampi of bellari one day they were digging a well in the house and they discovered a gold throne a gold cradle actually not a throne this is sometime in the early 1900s the man got all his daughters married off on by melting that gold this is my grandmother's story about her grand uncle so this was the way people just abandoned everything and went away from hampi overnight what was a city with 10 lakhs of population 60 miles of circumference palaces temples treasuries markets everything vanished somewhere i think there is a kernel of truth in what purandara das has said that this whole world is illusory and one day it will all go away no matter what we try to do with it thank you so very much thank you shriram as usual it was wonderful how much of facts how much of history you must have done a lot of research and a quite a unknown subject thank you very much thank you all rasikas thank you